Thank you, Helen. I'm, I'm actually only 37. Uh, it's been quite a <laughs> okay. um, How long have I got, Helen? Um, Around 20 minutes, roughly. About 20 minutes or so. Because uh, I don't want to sort of um, overshadow what uh, uh, Michael and, and Lincoln have said already, so I'll try and cut through uh, some of those things. But um, uh, what I was planning to do was uh, to talk about three conflicts, uh, two currently being fought, one in the making, um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the Australian response to, to our strategic outlook. So first conflict is obviously uh, Israel-Gaza, although I think perhaps the better way to think about it is Israel-Iran. And uh, based on um, what I'm seeing in, in this evening's news, it does it doesn't look as though Israel is now getting ready for what they have described as the final stage of the conflict in Gaza, which is to move into Rafa. And they've, they've done that already. They've moved across uh, the, uh, the crossing point there um, uh, in quite a, a limited manoeuvre that I think is driven by intelligence telling them where they think um, key Hamas leaders are, are based. Um, three real purposes of, of continuing the, the military operation. One is to go after the political leadership of uh, Hamas, in particular Sinwa, who does appear to be uh, in the tunnels uh, down in the south of Gaza, surrounded by a number of, uh, of hostages. Second reason, of course, is to uh, rescue the hostages, around 130 of them uh, still in captivity, unknown as to what their, um, what their situation is. Um, and then there is the military target of four remaining um, Hamas brig brigades, so-called mil military units, uh, which have been getting pretty hungry over the last uh, few, few months, waiting in those um, uh, tunnels in, um, uh, in the south of Gaza. I expect this to be um, a much more limited military campaign than I think people are imagining. I think this is going to be much more targeted, um, intelligence-driven, sort of snatch-and-grab type uh, missions to capture political leaders. And one reason for that is because Israel is really turning its mind to what I think is going to be the next big stage of the conflict, um, and that's dealing with Hezbollah, uh, which is a much larger, more coherent force based in southern Lebanon with much greater degrees of, uh, of armaments. And really the key concern here is that Israel is concerned about the potential for Hezbollah to, to do to the north of Israel what Ham Hamas did in, in the south of Israel, and that's flood across the border. Uh, many of you would know there are in the order of 100,000 Israelis that have actually moved from their residences in the north of the country uh, and won't go back until such time as there's a sense of uh, greater security for them. So. So for Israel, um, you know, th this is um, this is an existential conflict. Um, you know, it's it's a forty-five minute drive from uh, Tel Aviv to uh, the northern border. It's a slightly longer drive uh, from Jerusalem to to the Gaza border. It's not a big country, and and so their ability to protect that that territory for them really goes to the, the future of Israel. Um, then beyond the Iranian proxy groups. Um, of course, there's been, in the last few weeks, strikes between Iran and Israel directly. My sense is that Iran is going to walk back from that now. I think they were surprised at the extent to which they were unable to damage targets with their drones and missiles. Um, we've heard the figure of 98% of, uh, of those um, platforms being, being shot down by the Israelis or, or Allied forces. Uh, and I think Iran is also surprised at the relative success of a much smaller um, Israeli drone strike. Um, and so what Iran is going to do is to move back to using its proxies uh, to, uh, to fight the conflict for them. And I think you can think about what's happening at the moment in Gaza and elsewhere is really a series of coordinated fights all with common denomination of being backed, funded, trained and equipped by Iran. And that's Hamas in Gaza, that's Hezbollah in Lebanon, that's the, uh, the Houthis in um, Yemen, Yemen uh, and a number of other uh, insurgency groups um, in Syria and um, elsewhere 
in the Middle East, and um, Iran is doing this ostensibly targeting Israel, but really with the broader strategic objective of being the dominant power in the in the Middle East. And um, Iran's chief backers, uh, Russia and China, uh, and that becomes a common theme uh, in some of the things that I'll say later on. Um, the second war in Ukraine, um, it's largely been stalemated over the last six months, if not a bit longer, over the, over the European winter. Neither side has control of the air over the battlefield, and that's been, I think, one of the interesting consequences of the technology which has been brought into play, largely drones. Drones have made it very difficult for either side to move forward. Uh, in terms of prosecuting ground campaigns. Drones can see um, troops moving and they can have artillery fire directed onto those positions. Or there are drones which are carrying weapons and they can obviously fire uh, at, uh, at moving forces as well. It's very difficult to fly aircraft or helicopters into that area, um, likewise for those dangers. And so what we're getting is a sort of a 21st century version of a First World War experience. People have dug in to the ground, literally, to save themselves, with um, no clarity around how either side can, can actually move forward. Russia's strategy, um, if I boil it down, is size, um, size of its population, plus time, plus attacks on civilians, plus uh, grinding military attri attrition directed against the Ukrainians. The aim being to ultimately force Ukraine to the negotiation table. Ukraine's strategy is Western support plus technological agility plus strong popular backing um, of the Ukrainian population for their fight. <laughs> and that has so far managed to keep them sufficiently viable to prevent um, a Russian backdown. Both sides have significant weaknesses. Um, in the case of Ukraine, it's demographics. It's a country of 47 million people. They've already had to change, widen the parameters of their conscription in order to find sufficient numbers of people to, to bring to the conflict. One of Russia's weaknesses is its military inability to achieve battlefields advantage. Um, and, you know, that is something which eroded almost within weeks of the second attack uh, 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 two, two years or so ago. So I think what's going to happen is that as we move into the northern summer, this, this next six months is really going to be a crucial phase in, in the fight. But I find it hard to um, actually call what's, uh, what's going to happen. So um, I'll, I'll cop out of trying to predict the outcome and instead just point out some things which I think are important to watch. Watch for changes. So we should be looking for changes of Ukrainian or Russian popular moods about the war. Um, and there, I don't frankly think much is going to happen over the next six to 12 months. I think the Ukrainian population is pretty strongly um, uh, behind, if not Zelensky, uh, behind the idea of Ukrainian independence. Um, I think that although there is a sense of exhaustion about the war, um, that the bulk of Russia's population is behind Putin. Um, and it's difficult to see that change. Could we see a change of American attitude? Well, yeah, we could. Um, I mean, it seems to me quite likely now that Trump is going to win the presidential election, barring some unexpected change at the Democrat National Congress in, in um, August. And, you know, Trump has said how he's got his plan, he's going to fix the war in a day. Um, I don't think he's actually going to be able to do that. I think we've got to factor in the differences between the rhetorical Trump and the reality of what it is he'll have to deal with. But um, that's definitely something to pay attention to. Uh, could we see changes of European view? Well, actually, the Europeans are pretty solid on this. Um, the Europeans have 
become the Europeans that the Americans have said they wanted for a generation. They're spending more on defence. They do perceive an existential threat from Russia. I think they're going to continue to back Ukraine even if the Americans uh, become um, less committed. Perhaps the most significant possibility for change is in the perspective of China. Um, and here I would make the point that China is Russia's enabler to continue the war. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier about how we had um, a Chinese uh, aircraft fire um, chaff at an Australian helicopter. What that helicopter was doing, it was uh, flying off the Hobart, um, uh, a ship that's actually doing sanctions enforcement around North Korea. And in fact, the Toowoomba was doing the same sanctions enforcement mission a few months ago when China attacked our uh, naval divers. How is this all connected? Well, one of the things that they're doing on sanctions enforcement is actually preventing North Korea from exporting ammunition to Russia. Uh, and they can do that through a rail route, which takes forever to move across uh, Siberia, or they, they can do that at sea. And so China's attempts to stop the international community imposing sanctions on North Korea for exporting weapons kind of tells you why they're being so offensive towards Australia today. Again, it's the hand of China. So if, if Xi Jinping begins to think that Russia's failure to achieve victory against Ukraine becomes embarrassing to him, I could see him beginning to put pressure on Putin to, to end the war. I think that's something to, to watch. And could we see um, change on the battlefield, unexpected victories? Probably only in a tactical way rather than something that's going to lead to big strategic breakthroughs. So I think what we're going to see, frankly, is a continued stalemate over the next, over the rest of 2024. My third conflict is one that's in the making, and that's China in the Indo-Pacific. Now, I could talk to you um, for a very long time about China, and, and I'm not going to try and repeat some of the things that, that uh, Michael put forward here. But I just want to sort of give you five big facts about China as, as a way of sort of circumventing a much longer talk. One is unprecedented military growth. The pace with which China is engaging um, in growing its military is astounding. But that's also partnered with um, quite open exhortations on the part of uh, Xi Jinping to say to the military, prepare for war. Uh, there's no secret about this. This is not sort of top secret stuff that only folk know about it in uh, intelligence agencies. It is a very public um, uh, uh, demand. And it's leading to a sustained tempo of Chinese military activity around Taiwan, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, becoming increasingly risky, as we've seen uh, with the recent inc incidents that we've just um, talked about. Second big fact about China is that I think we're now several years past what I would call peak China. I think China's growth is now starting to significantly slow. Uh, people here would be aware of the very difficult, um, in some respects, um, uh, um, the result of bad policy choices, but the very difficult demographic situation that China has, which has seen the country grow old before it, it grows rich. Uh, we're seeing um, a rising sense of unhappiness with the Communist Party, hints of which you see both at the beginning and at the end of the COVID uh, lockdowns, but a sort of a strong sense of dissatisfaction, which is being countered by the party becoming more authoritarian, cracking down much more harder in terms of discipline with the, uh, with the Chinese population. And so um, here is, here's the conundrum. Far from dealing with a China which is sort of continuing to grow and becoming all, all dominating, the, the reality is we're having to deal with a China which is now managing the consequences of its own decline. Uh, and I, I just want to kind of put the point, that's a more dangerous China. A China that's on the slide is actually more dangerous than a China that's on the rise. 
And so here's, here's my third fact, or my third point, which is to say that this is giving rise to a view that China is facing a, a use it or lose it moment in terms of its ability to use military force. Now, preemption, going first, has always been part of Chinese strategic thinking. Um, and it's also a vehicle for the Communist Party to sort of harness um, Chinese public opinion, that very strong sense of nationalist sentiment. If you can't give them growth, you can give them a war. Uh, and it seems to me that that's one of the directions that they're, they're moving to. Point four is that the effect of China's behaviour is not winning at friends anywhere. Uh, in fact, distrust of China and of Chinese intentions is growing. And we are beginning to see the consequences of serious pushback. So uh, December 23rd last year, you might have noticed that Japan announced a doubling of defence expenditure. Right, there might have been a point in our history when we would have been concerned about that, but you know, as Margaret Thatcher would say, rejoice. Um, I mean, that is that is a good development. Um, other countries are similarly, uh, including Taiwan, beginning to um, rethink their defence responses to this risky situation. And uh, you know, the the challenge with that, however, is that it. it it strengthens the preemption case, which one might imagine senior Chinese military leaders would be making uh, uh, to Xi Jinping. And finally, my fifth point on, on China is Xi Jinping himself. He's 71. I've studied him as closely as it's possible to study him when you don't speak uh, Mandarin. Um, I, I think his personal history is such that he thinks he has a unique um, historical mission to return China to uh, what he calls the great dream, which is the dream of Chinese dominance in a world of subordinate states, states and that only he can do it. And I think that his intention is to at least give that a good, a good try. Now, that's not to say that war is inevitable. What, what it really points to is the need for um, us to make sure that every morning when Xi Jinping wakes up, he concludes, not today. <laughs> Today's too hard. It's too difficult. That's called deterrence. Um, and this, I think, is the, the task that we need to really think about for the next few years. So when might this all happen? Well, the, the sort of view that you'll see in American journals and in intelligence establishments and defence establishments is the second half of the 2020s. Right, the second half of the 2020s, this is 2024. So I'm not talking about 10 or 15 years into the future, I'm talking about 12, 24, 36 months from now. Um, and that takes me to the next part of my talk, which is to talk about Australian defence policy responses. Um, and there, I'm not going to depart much from what my colleagues have already said, but I'll leave you with... Um, half a dozen or so points which try to talk through some of the detail of what is going on. Um, first one is, broadly speaking, you wouldn't get too much pushback in defence circles uh, at what I have just said. You get a little bit from DFAT, uh, you'd get this foreign affairs establishment, you'd get some from uh, the ABC, you'd get some from a few vice chancellors, I would suspect, but, but mostly in, in the people who think about these issues, that what I have described to you is a, is a fairly widely held view about the risk and the time frame that we face the risk. And we've seen that uh, now from uh, also statements that were issued by the Morrison government, the strategic update of 2020, and several documents put out by the Albanese government over the last couple of years, including most recently this national defence statement, uh, strategy that was released a couple of weeks ago. But my second point is um, there is just the most bizarre lack of clarity about what to do about it. And I think the government has kind of got itself to a point where it's flung up in its hands and said, there is nothing that we can do that will strengthen the defence force in the next half decade. And they are putting all of their sort of um, investment effort into the force that can be built in the sort of 2030s and beyond. 
And so the government announced, you know, uh, what it claimed was a significant increase in defence spending uh, just last week. It said it was going to lift defence spending from 2.1% of gross national product, which is roughly where it is now, to 23 at the end of a decade. Uh, and basically the bulk of those spending increases are going to happen probably about two elections and therefore two prime ministers and maybe four defence ministers from, from now. Um, now, it is true, we are going to spend $750 billion over the next 10 years on defence, so that's, that's not chump change. And there's going to be about $50 billion brought into the defence budget, which is new money that the Labour Party has agreed in the next decade. But 90% of that comes in the second half of those 10 years, rather than the next five. The real story of the National Defence Statement that the government released is it's actually squeezing current investment in military technology to pay for the future force. And so, in fact, what the government is doing is it's reducing the military capability of the defence force at exactly the time it should be increasing the military capability of the defence force. And, you know, for the sake of brevity, I won't go into that in in huge detail, but just a couple of quick examples. Um, our, our surface fleet, the Navy's surface fleet, will go from a mass of 11 major ships down to nine uh, in the next five years. The government has decided not to upgrade our ANZAC ships with a new weapon system, uh, putting the money instead into the future frigates, which we'll see in the 2030s. The government decided to cut our army's troop lift helicopter capability. Just got rid of it. They're the ones that you will have heard newspaper headlines of. They're going to be cut up and buried. And what that means is that we won't actually have the capacity to lift troops by helicopters around a battlefield until sometime around 2026, 27. The government decided to cut about 60% of a new armoured vehicle built for our army, which means in an army of 30,000 people, we will have one battalion that's capable of deploying to a battlefield in armoured vehicles, um, significantly less than, for example, what we had uh, at the time of the East Timor crisis. Uh, the latest policy statement decided we would not buy um, a fourth squadron of joint strike fighters which, contrary to what you might read in the press, is actually an amazingly good aircraft. Well, we could have had them over the next couple of years. We're not going to buy them now. The government's cut a decision to buy two new supply vessels for the Navy. So Richard Miles talks about impactful protection, but we won't have the ability to supply our Navy when they do uh, go to uh, distant theatres. Uh, and on and on. Um, so much so that, you know, one begins to wonder if they're not actually trying to make the Defence Force less capable uh, so that when the moment comes and the phone rings from the White House, the only answer is to say, Mr President, there's, there's not much we can do other than to sort of offer our, our territory as, uh, as uh, space for, for you to think about what you're now going to do. Um, now, I don't want to go on too much longer. Um, let me just mention um, AUKUS very briefly. Um, the key to this is the idea of pooling industrial and R&D scientific capability across the UK, Australia, the United States and now Japan. And I think that's a good idea. Um, I think that helps to, in some respects, reduce risk that um, all countries face when they're dealing with um, new and emerging technology. Um, and the progress has been better than I expected in terms of the Americans, for example, cutting away regulatory impediments to making AUKUS cooperation happen between the two countries. I'm not sure that um, Scott Morrison or Anthony Albanese, though, really understood the, real, the cost of what AUKUS would mean. And, you know, just a couple of examples of that. 
uh, we will get from the Americans uh, two to three Virginia-class nuclear submarines. The Virginia-class nuclear submarine has a crew, the equivalent of two and a half Collins submarine crews. Right? We, we have currently five Collins submarines operating in the water. We have five crews. Two and a half crews from a, a Collins are required to crew a Virginia-class submarine. Um, construction. Uh, we celebrate that Adelaide is going to become the construction centre for, uh, you know, one of the most complex um, technological endeavours known to man, the building of a new design of a nuclear submarine. That There are two yards in the States that do this, each with workforces of about 15,000 directly working in those yards. You would be lucky across Australia to put 200 new maritime engineers together. You know, that's the scale of the uplift that has to happen. Um, and then there's a new port for the East Coast, um, the waste storage regime. You know, is our government's heart really in it? And what's plan B if, if AUKUS falls on it? Michael, Michael mentioned recruiting. Um, I won't sort of um, go into more detail on that, simply to say that we are now seeing between five and 600 people leave the ADF every month. Um, and uh, the government professes um, astonishment about how this can be. They're being paid large uh, sign-on bonuses. They're, they're being paid significant bonuses to stay on when periods of uh, separation choice uh, become available to them. It's very clear, and that is to say, if you're a, a, a young person, say, working in the helicopter regiment in the army, and you know that you have no future for the next two years other than to be flying in simulators before real helicopters are arrived, you're going to exercise your choice to leave the service. And there are a lot of, a lot of people who are actually doing that right now because they're in the current Defence Force. They're not that worried about what the Defence Force in 15 or 20 years looks like. Um, and so I think we are going to see you know, an even bigger recruitment crisis develop over, over the next little while. Um, and that means to say it undercuts the, um, the capacity of the government to bring on any of this new fancy equipment that we're talking about in, uh, in 15 years' time. I'm going to finish just by very briefly um, talking about what, what can you do about this? Uh, because I know, I know from experience that uh, I, do, I do depress my audiences um, a little. <laughs> um, I usually, I, I look out on a sea of somewhat glum faces, and um, uh, I, I like to say at this point that I'm, I'm also available, actually, by the way, for children's birthday parties and parties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for an extra price, I will, I will give similar talks in a clown soup, which is actually <laughs> even more scary. <laughs> um, but um, what can you do? Um, there's, there's a lot that you can do. Don't be caught by surprise. Okay, stay on top of the news, especially on what China is doing. Right? This is not something that's hidden behind top secret code words. It's not something that's disguised. You, if you read the newspapers and you know follow some of the news weeklies, you will have a good sense about what's what's going on. There is no excuse for being surprised about what China is actually doing. Second point, and this might sound a bit trite, but I can guarantee you it works. Let your local MP know that defence and national security is important to you. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time up in Parliament House talking to politicians of all different political stripes, and often I will get a sort of a barometer of, are people talking to you about defence issues or national security issues? Well, not all the time, but... Uh, increasingly, they will say people ask about China. They're interested to know what China's doing. So find a way to let your MP know that this matters to you. Second little, thirdly, um, talk to family and friends. Right? I, I can tell you as a guy who spent my career as a civilian in the defence world and knowing lots of people who've gone into the military that defence, in spite of everything I've said, has brilliant career options. So if you know people in, uh, you know, your extended families who've got kids thinking about what their uh, choices might be, they want a free education and a decent salary, you know, they can go and get a degree at ADFA 
um, they will have unparalleled opportunities to give public service and to do interesting and exciting things. So get your get your families and networks to think about these things. Finally, um, ask yourself, how would you or your family deal with a situation where you have a cup to power supply, right? or you can't get access to an ATM for cash, and electronic transfer systems are down, or you can't get fuel for your motor vehicle. Um, this this is going to be the world that we will face. You know whether or not the Indo-Pacific is at war. It is going to be a world where conflict starts in terms of the destruction by cyber means of critical infrastructure. And just think through the implications of what that might mean. Um, don't be the last person fighting in coals for the last toilet roll. Um, it's no one's responsibility other than yours to think about your personal resilience and your family resilience. Um, I certainly agree with my previous colleagues here that this is a conversation that our government desperately needs to have with the Australian people, and they know it. It's been put to them. They just don't know how to start the conversation. But I think the fact that we're here tonight is a good indication that there is community interest. Um, and, well, I'll stop at that point. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to our discussion.